Mike check. Mike check. This is 508, a show about Worcester. I'm Mike Benedetti. Also on the show today, Worcester Smile Ambassador Brendan Melican. Good morning. And Bill Coleman. Hey, how are you? Bill, thanks for being on the show. It's great to have you on. Running for you're running for city council and for uh, uh, the mayor. Are you running for the mayor this year? City council and mayor. Uh, city council at large and mayor. So two votes for Bill Coleman. Two votes for Bill Coleman. We're going to mostly talk about Bill today and talk with Bill today on the show. Also, we're going to talk about Occupy Worcester and Occupy Boston at the very tail end of this show. Um, so we're going to ask Bill some questions, which are sort of from the standard list of questions we've been asking candidates. Let me scoot around here. Uh, there's now the, you know, the lighting changes second by second here at Cook's Pond. It's amazing how that works. Um, Bill, what line of work are you in? Uh, I'm an educator. I teach for the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and uh, I teach in public schools and alternative ed programs, a basic nutrition course. And uh, on occasion, I help run seminars on public policy where we teach people around the country in a program called Family Community Leadership, how to work within government, how to write grants, and how to get how to engage your community. Hmm. So, uh, you know, busy. So, um, as the mayor, as if, if you were elected mayor of Worcester, among other things, you'd be the chair of the school committee. Mm -hmm. and one question we've been asking everybody is about their, their, their stance on school privatization, on charter schools, on that whole trend. What is your what is your take on that? Well, uh, I wish there was a separate funding source for the charter schools and, uh, you know, different alternative ed programs that take public funding away from existing public schools. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a reimbursement formula where the public schools do get money back when charter schools uh, take away from their existing budgets. But I wish there was just a separate line. Um, I believe the competition is good. Uh, I, as a member of the Massachusetts Teachers Association and the National Education Association, uh, from a union standpoint, I'd like to organize the teachers in charter schools. They have no protections. They're employees at will. Mm -hmm. They can be fired. And some of those teachers are doing incredible jobs in helping kids that might be a little challenged and wired a little differently to find their personal intellectual hotspot. So, uh, you know, I'm a committed educator to see that we find different sources for funding, or at least we start gelling together interactive programs within our schools to make sure that all of our children have the best possible opportunity to learn at the way they learn. Not everybody learns the same way. Yeah. I'm deeply concerned about our 30% dropout rate in our Worcester Public Schools with all the fine things that we're doing. So we know that we need to reformulate so that that dropout rate is non-existent or at least cut in half. Okay. Um what is local government's role in regulating the day-to-day -day lives of citizens, and is there a limit? Well, I, I come from a standpoint of believing limited government uh, in the individual lives of people, but government has to create the safety net in a community so that we have uh, safe streets, safe neighborhoods, and also to make sure that we have opportunity for people to prosper and to be personally successful. You know, and that's creating an environment where there's employment opportunities, not only for adults, but during the summertime for kids to get summer jobs and recreation, as well as during the wintertime. Because many of the kids in school today, they come to school late. If you're late so many days, you don't graduate. Yeah. And we're finding that uh, the reason why they're late is because they're helping their families. They're working until uh, 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. And we need to look at all those factors that create an environment where people can be successful. And I think one of the biggest ones here is inviting industry to come to our city and to provide jobs. What is your personal vision for the city? My personal vision is for the city, I have to reiterate that I want to make this a city where everybody can be a success. Okay. Here we are in the Tatnick <clears throat> area of the city of Worcester, beautiful area. Uh, you know, my kids grew up around here, they're friends. Uh, you, you hear the chirping of the birds. <laughs> you don't hear ambulances and police cars zooming up and down your street. Yes. You know, this is where, what I want, a, a city where people can feel nature and feel safe. Not walking down the street wondering if all of a sudden a car is going to pull by, the window is going to roll down, and you're going to be the victim of a drive-by. Yeah. And uh, it might be a, a, a mistake in whatever. It's just I, I don't want people to feel unsafe in this city. Hmm. Just to be fair, that particular bird chirping is getting kind of annoying at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'll walk, I'll walk over. Yeah, over and throw a rock at it. <laughs> We're not attacking any birds on the show, Brendan. <laughs> Just be, be cool, man. Be cool. Um, 
What's your view on the relationship between the city council and the city manager? Um, I think it's one of intimidation. We have a very competent, able uh, city manager and Mike O'Brien, and I remember when Mike O'Brien first came to the city, he held several different positions. My personal relationship with him was established when he was uh, Commissioner of Parks and Recreation. And uh, um, in 2003, there was no money to open up our city pools. Our, the state had given us a $28 million revenue cut. And so one of the first things to go that was being suggested was the pools and beaches weren't going to be open that year. So I went before the city council on three occasions uh, with a plan to raise money to open up our pools and beaches. The first two occasions I went, they filed my motion. On the third occasion, I was really persistent, and mm -hmm. uh, I said, you know, uh, I have a plan to open up the pools. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. We have a revenue shortcut. We can't do it. Motion to it. And before they said file, I screamed, I have $150,000 <laughs> in pledges. And then uh -huh. all of a sudden, I looked like, you know, Joseph coming home to his long-lost parents <laughs> uh, with money, having yeah. just won the lottery. And uh, uh, the city manager, they, they recommended it to the city manager. Michael O'Brien called me the next morning. Within four days, we had two hundred thousand uh, dollars in pledges from all over New England, all over the, the city of Worcester and then by the time we were all set and done we had raised four hundred and twenty thousand dollars saved eight city workers jobs opened up every pool and beach in the city of Worcester and had a billboard on 290 for six months and the kids really enjoyed the opportunity working with Park Spirit we called the program save our summer mm -hmm. so that was a successful thing just by uh, a citizen initiative uh, working with a community who wanted to help. Yeah. So, but, but so just to roll back to the the uh, the council and manager relationship, you said intimidation. Well, I think the council is very intimidated by the ability of Michael O'Brien to pull together so many different uh, facets of a community, mm -hmm. business leaders, outside government leaders, and he's a he's a straight up person. Mm -hmm. And before the council would like. Uh, to micromanage. Over the years I've seen councils who would literally try to micromanage existing city managers. And when Michael O'Brien came in, everybody kind of stood back and watched his learning curve mm -hmm. and realized this guy's a 24-7 guy. Yeah. But he also works within the good people that are in city government. He called, He turned, He turned. said one time when I was talking to him that, you know, he was under the, the, uh, the, the learning of former city manager Tom Hoover. Yeah. And when Tom Hoover came to town, he just said to the existing city uh, department heads, do your job. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you want to do. Prior to Tom Hoover coming to town, we had Jeff Mulford. And before Jeff Mulford, we had Francis McGraw. But at that time, we used to hire a lot of consultants that would come in. The city would pay big money and say, how can this department work better? And uh, then uh, many people said, why are we hiring so many consultants? Why don't we just hire, ask the, the department heads? And when Tom Hoover came to town, that's what he did. He had a strategic planning meeting. Mm -hmm. He asked everybody, okay, how can your department do it better? And people said, this is how. Yeah. So we saved a lot of money. So, I, you know, Michael Bryan comes in that. He lets people, it's a collective, uh, successful process, yeah. you know, of him managing and people operating the city. But but the city council now doesn't micromanage as much as it tries to. Sometimes yeah. they try to make some suggestions here and there. And Michael O'Brien gives them that nice old corporate <laughs> diplomatic answer. Uh, we'll get a report on that for you, Councilor. Mm. So, yeah, on, just if I can go one step further on that. I mean, I think we all know that technically, or not technically, it is the, the council that is, should be setting the agenda for the city manager, or at least in theory, they're his boss. Um, and I think you stated quite well that, you know, it's a relationship ensemble based of in, in, on intimidation. And I also think there's no question that Michael Bryan is probably the most competent person in the room, almost at universally. Do you think there is potential for strong leadership on that council to be able to help set an agenda for the administration that doesn't appear adversarial, but also works in the community's favor, which oftentimes it seems as though you do have an administration that's over here doing its own thing, doesn't necessarily, you give a great example with the, the, the summer programs, doesn't always match up with what the community wants. Might actually be the right thing, you know, for, for when you're just looking at books, but mm -hmm. doesn't match up with, with community needs. Is there potential for leadership to come into that council and redirect that administration without having an adversarial relationship? Yeah, I think I think the way we do that is one, the city council is the board of directors. If you look at it from a corporate standpoint, yeah. we set the agenda, we set the uh, we set the direction of where we want to go as a city. Well, right now everybody's pretty much on the same page. We realize that the national economy sometimes hits at a gridlock. 
because of the way our Congress works. But we have an able, capable congressman who has navigated through the system and has directed more funding into this community and into this state. And then working with, uh, you know, his, uh, his number one lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Tim Murray, Lieutenant Governor Tim Murray, we're directing a lot of things to Worcester, but we're missing some people. You know, why have 32 businesses up and left Worcester? Why don't we have the major manufacturing? And we saw this coming in the 70s, mm. and we didn't adjust. Mm. You know, uh, I used to be able to name 19 companies that once existed and hired almost 36,000 people. It gone from the city of Worcester, but what are we doing for that next phase of employment opportunity and prosperity in this community? I think we can have strong leadership that's not adversarial, and but the way we uh, incorporate the community into really participating in government is going back to our city charter that was passed in 1985 mm -hmm. and implemented in 1987, and that's by having something that was never really put together, citizen councils. Citizen councils were uh, every neighborhood to allow people to really become citizen legislators in their neighborhood and to take that collective energy and to help the city council uh, set the agenda for the city's future. Uh, while the city manager would incorporate bringing in uh, corporations and more businesses and looking at our tax rate that's really attractive to them. There's some discrepancies there, which stops businesses from coming right to the uh, over our border. Right. Since he just answered your next question, um, <laughs> that is the next question on the list is neighborhood councils. I, but you know, I, I just wanted to throw in there that this is why ultimately I hope the city council votes on and passes the addition um, of the uh, you know the expansion of the school committee. Yes. Not because, because I, it's a charter question. Not because I agree with it, but because <laughs> next year they have absolutely no excuse now not to at least vote on or put to the ballot you know whether it be a strong mayor petition or a neighborhood council petition. Well, and I hope someone actually goes into council and admits and, and points it out to them that you're now you're now talking charter change. And since the mid-80s, you've said, charter change isn't the purview of the council. We need to leave that to the people. You folks go get your 35 grand, and when you do, we'll put it on the ballot for you. They've already, they've now taken that big step and said, you know, we actually, charter change is under our purview as long as it suits our needs. And I hope somebody actually comes to them once everybody's signed back up next January and things are settled and says, hey, look, you know, you've already opened this door. Now it's our turn to rush through it, and, and let's start making some change in the city. Now, the heartbreaking thing is, I had a question on the uh, before the council and it really went back to 2007 and the question was a basic question that they refused to let the voters vote on this year and the question was do you want a review of your charter yeah mm. you know i put that down there and it wasn't good enough for them so they came up with their other question do you want to expand the school committee and they're basically the same thing mm. the question asks it's a survey question say to people do you want to review any aspect of the charter yeah you know and i recently put a question before the council which they very well could have put before the voters would you like to allow 17-year-olders to mm -hmm. vote in local municipal elections? Right. An effort that was pushed up in Lowell. But they shot they, they shot it down to a parliamentary procedure by uh, City Councilor Paul Clancy, who's not running for re-election. But then again, I went before the council uh, recently, and I asked that that particular uh, petition be amended to go before the uh, voters in the 2000, November 5th, 2013 election. Uh, but there's going to be a public hearing on that at some point. That's going to be hmm. down the road. But right. my whole thing is, hey, let's get more people engaged in government and let's get them engaged at a little younger age and, and uh, you know, let's see what happens there. Let me, let me ask you a question. I want to ask you the next question, which is about economic development. This is sort of a long, this is sort of a long question, so you can take this question however you want. Um, where should the city draw the line in taking responsibility for development? Where should the city draw the line when selling off existing assets? How should the city be making its money, and what is the correct tax rate for Worcester homeowners? No, that's a good one. You know, the, there's a couple of things there. One, uh, the city should be asking businesses, which they have over, we have, we've done economic study on economic study. Why aren't businesses coming to Worcester? Now, years ago, I used to work at the Telegram and Gazette, and I sold advertising. Yeah. And part of our uh, research was, we, you know, we came out with Worcester is one hour within 13 million people. Okay. We are an economic hotspot. We have had businesses, Ford Motor Company wanted to come into Worcester and establish a uh, facility to build cars. Uh, when Framingham, when General Motors closed, the Framingham plant and almost 32,000, well, 32,000 people did lose their job uh, because the, the Board of Selectmen didn't allow them to build a new paint facility. But in essence, we found out afterwards that General Motors wanted to build the first Saturn car 
in Framingham, hmm. which would, would, have, it would have created so many other opportunities and tributary opportunities, even for Worcester uh, as a central hub. Uh, I think what the city is doing right now uh, by working with CSX to make it New England's regional hub, we're going to be the regional hub for all these trains coming through, which saves money, uh, which it, it increases the trucking, because if you move your major stuff over here by train and then you truck, you're going to have more jobs, so there's more opportunity. Uh, what would Economic development means that we need to look at the partials that have been uh, infected by uh, past business practices. You know, brownfields uh, and things brownfields like that. Brownfields and all this. And we built the St. Vincent's Hospital. If you went down there at 11 o'clock at night, they had all the hazmat people cleaning up barrels of, of coxic stuff that had been in the ground for years, infecting our canal district and all this, and the violation of the 1970s Clean Water Act implemented by former President Richard Nixon. And, uh, you know, we, we found that all this stuff was buried. They used to just bury stuff, whatever it was. We put it in the ground, we put it in the ground. Well, it affected our water, and some of these things are even known medically to have affected many of our children today yeah. through DNA passing down. But I think what we need to do is, you know, we have to look at that selling of Worcester, marketing Worcester. They say Worcester's the place to be. Worcester's this, Worcester's that. Well, you can't come here unless you have a tax rate that is fair to business. But, you know, we're a city right now that has a $5 million surplus. $5 million surplus, and in economic times like that, for a northeast region city, that has pr pretty much around a 7% unemployment rate, you know, uh, to have a $5 million surplus. It gives compliment to the existing management team of our city, but it also says that we know how to work within things that we need to do. But when you drive around Worcester, and I invite everybody to get on a bus, get a one-day pass, which will take you anywhere in the city, and spend three hours looking at your city. Many people don't know sections of the city. They hear mm. about them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do it sometimes, you know, when my car is broken. But a lot of times I, I used to just take my kids and say, let's go on a bus ride. <laughs> and it was great. And we would ride around the city, get off one bus, go to another bus, yeah. stop and have pizza, go to another bus. And I saw an incredible city that hit so many diversities, so many ideas. And I think people need to see it from the elderly and the services provided by the WRTA, the courteousness of the elderly. Of course, the characters that are on a bus anyway are just, <laughs> it's worth the money. There's some <laughs> great know? folks on the bus. It's, it's the great. Video. I mean, just listening to people on their cell phone talking about their personal business where yeah. everybody hears. I think that there's a lot of entertainment out here. There's yeah. a lot of sadness. There's a lot of entertainment. But I think we can sell our strong points, location, 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 educated workforce, uh, ability to tap into uh, the college uh, uh, the college population that graduates and wants to leave. And why can't we have them staying, buying homes, uh, raising their families, feeling that this is the place to be and not feeling like they're in a city that's separated by the seven hills. Yeah. Brendan, did you have any follow-up on economic development stuff? Yeah, the way Bill kicked that off, it brought one thought into my head that it may sound silly to some, but I think is, is relevant. You were talking about you know, the, 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 the distance uh, from 1.3 million, or people, the number of people Worcester is in close proximity to. I remember years ago, and I've heard this multiple times since, uh, someone in federal law enforcement explaining how Worcester is a central hub for narcotics distribution. Uh, it, and the way narcotics actually yeah. comes into the country sure. in multiple ports mm -hmm. oftentimes comes up to Massachusetts and Worcester to be cut and distributed. Mm -hmm. Again, it sounds silly, I'm sure, to some, but if you think about it, that's a fully unrela unregulated marketplace, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of risk involved, but it's unregulated in the sense that, you know, it's it's the Wild West once you, once you get past the law enforcement scene. There's a reason why that would come up here. And I think it is the close proximity to people, uh, you know, transportation. And Worcester is a hub in one regard in, in, in an area we probably would like it not to be. Uh, but it is because it actually makes a lot of sense, more so than maybe even Manhattan or other parts of the country that there might be more people but less access to larger areas. <laughs> this is an amazing argument, Brendan. <laughs> no, it, it just it sure, popped in my head when you say because I think about it all the time. The like, why would you not yeah. want to be in Worcester, whether it be Wachusett Mountain, or you know, going up in New Hampshire, or your proximity to the Cape, like you could you could pick any other part of New England and be kind of close to those things. But Worcester, you're close to all of those things. I can get to upstate New York in the same distance, at the same time. I can get to, to the Cape, uh, to New Hampshire, get down, go to Manhattan. Really, only takes right. three and a half three hours, hours yeah. if you do it right. Uh, you know, we're close to everything, and from either 
a residential, a manufacturing, or a commercial standpoint, it just makes sense to be here. So, like, what is that wall that that we must be the ones to put up, right? Because, I mean, the maps don't change depending where you are. Everyone can find us if they want to. They know what our population There's got to be a wall that we've put up that the drug dealers have figured out, <laughs> but the rest of the world is saying, yeah, not ready for them yet. Yeah. That's something we need to really reevaluate internally because the rest of the world isn't going to fix that for us. Oh, yeah, every, everything kind of stops at our borders. When you look at Fidelity Investments that left Worcester, they were on the bottom of Belmont Street across from UMass Medical. They moved over to Shrewsbury. I mean, we assess businesses, uh, and, and to talk about the assessment process, they're very boring to a lot of people. Mm. But for every $1,000 that your business is worth, we charge you $34 in taxes. Over uh, in Shrewsbury and surrounding towns, they charge $17 yeah. in taxes. Well, a lot of businesses, that's, a, that's an additional savings. That's if you're worth, you know, $3 billion uh, or whatever. That's quite a bit of money. That's quite a bit of money. But we've also had opportunities in the city of Worcester. We look at the St. Coban Company, which used to be called Norton Company. In the mid eighty, in the early 80s, they wanted to turn half of their company and some of their acreage over there into a resource recovery plan. You know, taking all of our trash, recycling it, redirecting it, selling what could be sold in plastics, metal, and glass, and uh, to build an incineration plant that generated its own energy for the company, which would have mm. been a big saving. Plus, also, it was able to, it was going to offer the city of Worcester $13 million a year for the ability to take all of its trash and put it together, and then they were going to hire 800 people. Well, the city council back in the mid 80s, in the early 80s, voted against allowing Norton Company to do that. So henceforth came Wheelabrator, a $65 million plant uh, proposed that ended up costing almost $170 million to build to cost more energy in trucking our recycling and our trash out to uh, Wheelabrator. And, it created a couple more industries, but there was a missed opportunity by our city council. Mm. And the city council back then said, you know, it was a bad vote. You know, and the, the problem was they held public hearings in the Greendale section. And I was at those public hearings and people were saying, we don't want that element in our neighborhood. And they thought all these trash trucks were going to come in the neighborhood. But if you go back a little further in history, you realize the existence of Route 190 was established for the sole purpose of building the resource recovery plant at the Norton Company. Hmm. And all the tra it would have been self-generating. You know, independent Norton Company could have expanded, and then the families got a little dazed and all this, and we got redirected, and we ended up uh, in a battle with a British company, and then we lost it, and then uh, St. Goban, a, a powerful company, just ate everything up, came in and as a benevolence, looked at the power and influence of Norton Company in its central location, and made a generous offer for stock buying. It wasn't a hostile takeover, but we lost out. We lost out on jobs. We lost out on existing revenue, but we've done creative things in our past by having a trash bag fee that brings in $13 million a year. Nobody talks about yeah. keeps our tax rates somewhat stable, but uh, let me cut you off there. Cause I need to ask you about the wire. Sure. Have you seen the wire? I have. Do you have a, do you have a favorite character on the wire? The whole show is interesting, but, uh, <laughs> I haven't stayed long enough. I got attention span issues. You know. I, I never blame anyone for not spending a lot of time watching television. That's fine with me. The other the other the other key question that we've been asking all the candidates is how much can you bench press? Uh, about probably about maybe one seventy five now. And these days. Yeah. That's not yeah. too bad. Yeah, unless you piss me off. Then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it more. There you go. Um Actually, we have the time. I want to. I want to ask you. I guess one more quick question: um, Would you support zoning changes to encourage mixed-use, diverse development of existing neighborhoods to encourage walkability? Yes. Okay. Brendan, do you have anything we get? How we much time have, do we have? We have. We have six minutes. I feel like we need to spend five minutes just wrapping up this Occupy yeah. Worcester thing. Absolutely. Do you, so, do you have a one-minute question for Bill? Um, no. I do. well, actually, yeah, I do. Um, so you've run for council <clears throat> quite a number of times, and that's I think a lot of people view. I, and I never understood why this is, but I think a lot of people view you as the perennial candidate. They say, well, "Why is he doing this again?" Right? Why oh, I didn't want to say the words "perennial candidate" I on this episode. I know. That's but, okay. But I people know. say it though, right? I mean, well, you hear, no, no, they're cutting back. You know, they they Telegram and Gazette for a couple of years used to refer as the unsuccessful candidate. If you ran for office once or twice, then all of a sudden they labeled you as the unsuccessful candidate. Now, mm -hmm. after a couple powwows with the Telegram and Gazette, not only uh, on my behalf, but it benefited other candidates, they don't refer to candidates as unsuccessful. 
once you become a candidate, you're a candidate. Mm -hmm. Now they refer to you as a uh, like a former candidate for city council or former candidate mm -hmm. for Congress because that unsuccessful tag was perennial, uh, cr just crazy. And perennial, I've not been a flower in my life, <laughs> you know. But and and that would drive me crazy. But what now they do is they say. Bill Coleman is persistent, determined, and then from a factual standpoint, look at it. The city of Worcester has no diversity on its city council, on its school committee. Mm -hmm. The last met black man that was elected to city government was 1936, a guy named Charles E. Scott. He served from 1970, when women didn't have the right to vote, to 1936, dying in office, mm -hmm. considered the dean of the council at the time. And before him, it was a guy named George Alfred Busby who served from 1903 to 1905. And there were so few elected African-Americans in the country. There was only a 14% African-American population who had the legal right to vote then, that this guy was hailed by newspapers all over the country because he won a seat in what was then called District 1 City Council, which was off Salisbury Street. He was a farmer. His wife was the first hired African-American school teacher in the Worcester Public Schools. And Worcester has a unique history. It's a history of new people coming here, establishing their own way, mm -hmm. uh, mainly by private business. Uh, if you wanted a good job and you were Swedish, Norton Company hooked you up. And everybody else kind of swept floors, and mostly African-American women, which I do give praise to, and a lot of women, they were domestics. Everybody, they just, that was the only job you can get. Mm. So you cleaned other people's homes, you raised other people's kids, uh, and uh, you were happy with your existence. We had neighborhoods uh, that were established, uh, African-American, some were Irish, uh, some were Swedish, some were Polish, Lithuanian, some of the languages that I grew up in Philadelphia speaking. So I was very comfortable coming here. But I'll tell you this. The city of Worcester has to embrace its diversity. It has to ask its people more things. Yes, we need neighborhood council. Yes, we need an ombudsman uh, for the city of Worcester, which was part of the charter change, never implemented. But somebody to go to outside of government that's in government mm. that will lend your ear. But the first thing people can do is vote Bill Coleman because <laughs> I will be the voice for the people who feel voiceless. And I will always welcome people to come to the city council and to speak and never, never stop people from speaking at a city council meeting. I'll hold One of my first uh, options as a city council or as mayor is to hold strategic meetings around the city of Worcester, listening sessions, lawn chair sessions, and then to engage young people to get involved and to create an opportunity for people to serve on boards and commission. And with you guys, the people who have yet to get their citizenship, who are living in Worcester and who are on a path toward citizenship, I would invite them as well to serve on boards and commissions because right now you can't serve on a board or a commission unless you're an American citizen hmm. and a registered voter in the city of Worcester. Hmm. And those who are uh, who want to serve, you can serve in any capacity. We need every voice to make us strong and to make our city welcoming. Bill, thanks for being on the show. Thank I'm you. very. It's been great you talking with totally you. Totally hijacked my question. What? You just. You two just totally hijacked my. Well, question. there you go. We're gonna. We're <laughs> gonna. Uh, I should. I should mention. So. So we're gonna shift gears here for a second. It. It is October the eighth, two thousand eleven, for television viewers. This is gonna run in a couple weeks. So we're gonna cut off the show, right here. For internet viewers, we're gonna talk for one second about Occupy Worcester, um, because uh, there's a gonna be a, like a public forum basically for Occupy Worcester behind City Hall on the Commons Sunday the 9th of October, 1.30 p.m. This is basically a chance for people to just like talk about what they're concerned about. You know the Occupy movement, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Boston. A lot of people concerned about um, the excessive amount of control that the financial industry has over our democracy and the corrupting effect that this has had in recent years. The, the uh, whole bailout fiasco, the whole economic collapse and bailout fiasco being like a really clear example of this. Um, this is like a totally decentralized movement so far. I really like that the Telegram and Gazette, in, uh, they quoted me in the, in the paper, and uh, they identified me as someone who had been to the meetings. <laughs> and I think that that's a great definition for, for, for a, a, a movement which is intentionally trying to have no leader, to not even have an organizer. Someone who'd been to the organizing meetings. Mm -hmm. that, that would be the most official that's, you could be. That's a really difficult concept, I think, for people to grasp. I, I had this conversation <laughs> with my mother, and she had a really hard time understanding how a group could function without a, uh, some degree of hierarchy. And I, I was trying to 
of break it down for in a very basic, like, do you need someone to tell you when it's time to wake up in the morning? Or like when you go have right. breakfast or like when it's time to go to work, like you figure out these things on your own. And if you need to bring somebody else into their group, like say when you, when your kids still lived in your house, like you didn't need someone to come in and say, okay, now it's time to get your kids ready to go to school, right? Like you, you're kind of able to work within a larger system on your own, figuring things out. And yeah. I just find it amazing how hard it is for folks to really grasp the concept of any group of people not needing either self-appointed or elected leadership to direct their movement. You know, if you're going to have a factory or you're going to have um, an army, I can totally get that, like, top-down leadership is a great way to run this. Mm -hmm. Like, for political movement, is not... I mean, I think by, by, by applying that model to a political movement, you're basically saying we want to treat this political movement like a factory, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily the best way to run a political movement, I think. I wanted to... So, anyway, so people should come out to this thing. There's, like... I've seen people criticizing Occupy Worcester already online, despite the fact that Occupy Worcester has made, like, no <laughs> anything. Like, people have posted things to Facebook as individuals about this. That's the... But people are still super angry and freaked out by Occupy Worcester. More power to you. Maybe in a week from now we'll know why you're so angry. I don't honestly know why right now. I wanted to ask you, Brendan, as someone who has been to uh, Occupy Boston on and off in mm -hmm. this, it's second week... Second. Today was the first, it was, last night was actually the first anniversary, so it's gone Friday to Friday. All right. They had had a couple of days of stuff before last Friday. They had Friday, their right? meeting similar to what's going to start Sunday with Worcester up on the Boston right. Common right. for uh, half a week prior. All right. Oh, this is actually the one week anniversary of Occupy Worcester, because last week on this show, Mike Check, <laughs> Mike we, 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 we pretended occupied. that we were, yeah. who's pond? Cook's pond. What what's you have any you have any quick anecdotes about Occupy Boston or any vibes from Occupy this Boston? This week? week was just amazing out there. I mean the the, the growth in support and the growth and both in people actually at the the site. Um, they're running out of space now, and they're they're trying to figure out where they're going to move, where they're going to expand to because they really can't fit any more tents in Dewey Square Park. Uh, but starting on Tuesday, I mean, you had uh, it was five buses of nurses, unionized nurses, show up. Three hundred nurses came down to uh, to march uh, with um, the organizers. Uh, uh, the, the group as a whole, uh, you had a, a mass student walkout of all the colleges in Boston uh, that coincided with the, the nurses union showing up. Uh, so it was about 1,500 students marching in uh, on uh, Dewey Square Park. And then out of nowhere, Cornell West showed up with a megaphone to address the crowd. I mean, you couldn't have scripted. If you're writing a movie, you couldn't have written a better scene. And that seemed to just kick off a steamroll. Now suddenly the politicians are coming down saying, hey, I want to listen to what you're saying. The um, more unions are, are signing up. The AFL-CIO, uh, Bo the Boston Labor Council, you know, signed a, a, a memo of solidarity uh, asking their supporters to go down, offer support. Um, and it's interesting, I think, there's a lot of folks still missing the point, uh, especially with the, in the, the political crowd. Say, hey, we need to get down there and see what these folks want. And talking to people down there, they don't want anything <laughs> other than the politicians to stay away or, you know, join, but don't try and co-opt the movement in terms of, uh, from a leadership perspective, which We'll see how that works out. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for thanks for reporting there. Bill, again, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, and everyone, we'll see you on, on television and on the Internet next week. Bye-bye.